Hi, everyone. Um, so my name is Gigi Alcock. I'm going to be talking about uh, what I call gasinomics, or the economics of the informal economy. Um, some of you will have, last time, heard my presentation. So uh, don't worry, it's not the same presentation. Uh, and even those who've seen it more recently, although there are parts of it that are very similar. Um, but I just kind of want to say before I kind of introduce myself, all those other guys who spoke this morning left out this part of the economy. And I believe, and I'm pretty sure by the end of it you'll agree with me, that one of the hopes for South Africa is an economic hope based on the economy that's happening in a space that's in essence invisible to a large portion of the economy, a large portion of, of kind of government and, and corporate life. Um, but very quickly, I, I grew up in a mud hut in a Zulu village in a place called Msinga in KwaZulu-Natal. Uh, we um, <clears throat> basically grew up like Zulu kids. Uh, my parents uh, were political activists and uh, basically built a mud hut in the very worst place they could find in South Africa. We washed in the Tugela River. Our, my mother taught us at home at a stone bench under an acacia tree. Our kitchen was another. Um, was a, a gas cylinder under another acacia tree. Um, my mother's 82, she still lives like that in the mud hut and refuses to, to change her life. Um, and, um, and, and we basically kind of learned really about life in that kind of space. And, and uh, uh, years, um, when I was a kid, I said to my father, uh, will you send me to university? And, he said, um, I can't afford to send you to university, but I'll prepare you for life in Africa. And I think often, you know, so I never went to university. Um, and, and often we kind of live in this place and we don't actually know where to look to understand things about lifestyle and behavior and culture and, and even econom economics. Uh, and I was lucky enough to be brought up to, to look at that. Um, and so kind of part of what I'm suggesting we do today is at the end of it is kind of open our eyes to different kind of economies and different spaces out there. Um, so, um, and, and, and excuse me for those who've heard the story, but uh, you know, my favorite story is, is I kind of, I moved to Johannesburg, they called Johannesburg Wandonga Zyaduma, which means the place where the walls thunder. And um, you know, Johannesburg's obviously a scary place if you live in, in, a, in a Msinga. Oh, by the way, people often say to me, where's Msinga? And I used to struggle to say where Msinga is. Now I say it's right next door to Nkandla. So <laughs> they'll tell you where it is. Um, so, um, so I moved to Johannesburg, and, um, and, and my kind of first uh, understanding of the real benefits of growing up like I was uh, was, um, was a financial transaction, actually. I was not a pick and pay. Uh, and I was, uh, I'd purchased my groceries and I was busy writing out a check to pay for them. And the lady behind the counter said to the lady who was packing my bags, she said, which means look at this white man, he's got hair like a baboon. Um, talking about my arms, as you can see, not my head. So I said nothing and I wrote out the check. And um, as I gave her the check, I said, have you ever seen a baboon writing out a check? With which this poor lady said, sorry, bus. <laughs> so I said, oh, thanks for going for saying you know, I've gone from baboon to bus. And uh, this poor lady fled and stood behind this pillar going, sorry, bus, sorry, bus, and wouldn't finish my transaction. But I realized in that moment that the real benefit wasn't about speaking the language, although that's quite important, but many people speak many languages in our society. But the more important thing about connecting with people and communicating is really about understanding deeper things about lifestyle, about culture, about sarcasm and irony and hopes and fears and dreams. And these are the kind of things that shape our interactions far more than just language. Um, and I built this into, I, I started a marketing business, one of the very first businesses um, that focused on marketing in the townships in the early 90s. As hard as it is to believe now, no one believed there was a market in the townships. And I launched a business called Mena Nawe Marketing, which was a kind of pioneer of marketing in these spaces. And over 20 odd years, I, I sold my business in 2018 to a French multinational who destroyed it fairly quickly. Um, but they paid me, so that was fine. Um, but um, over those 20 years, we did some of the 
um, kind of quite extraordinary um, case studies uh, of, of work in the township spaces, uh, of which I wrote about in Gasinomics and Gasinomic Revolution. Um, and so importantly, everything I'm going to talk about today, none of it is research. I'm not a researcher. I went, never went to university. I was a bricklayer for a while, so no skills in research. But all the stuff I want to talk about is actually stuff done as part of business. When we convinced a client to spend money with us, we had to understand certain elements about that market that we were involved in. Uh, and this is very important, because anyone can do a research report and then come to you guys and say, hey, well, here's a report, and then walk away, and hey, maybe sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. Ours is kind of bomb-proof, because it was kind of, this is what we think is happening out there, this is where we think the opportunity is. If it failed, they fired us, and I kept most of my clients for, for kind of 15, 20 years. So moving on from that, um, to, to talk about, you know, we're surrounded by kind of negative news, a fair amount was put up there, the rest we find on our phones every single day. And one of the dangers is, is that we kind of, this headline does not set a trend. And so we have all of these headlines, we're doomsday scrolling through our phones, and there's a very different space out there. And it's a dramatically different space. And, uh, you know, we hear about massive unemployment, it's not true. We hear about massive inequality, it's not true. I'm not saying things aren't bad, and there's nothing good I can say about load shedding. But as I'll show you, uh, most of the stuff that is out there is not true for the majority of people in this country. So just as a starting place to kind of shape our thinking, this is a Gorko in downtown Johannesburg who sells Fedcook or Amaguinia. And this Gorko sells 3,000 Fedcook every single day. Uh, for one rand each. She also sells tea and coffee and cheese slices and stuff. She turns over three and a half thousand rand a day, six days a week. Her and her husband have been doing it for 10 years. They make a margin of about 50% on that. And yet we kind of, you know, feel, walk past her and kind of go, oh, shame. I presented this, by the way, to, to some of the Capitec execs, and I met one of the guys on the plane the other day, and he said, you know, <laughs> he says, our CEO often says to the staff, he says, Your, you branch managers earn less than that Gorgo who's selling fair cook in, in downtown Joburg. Anyway, um, so we kind of have to just think differently about this kind of how much people are potentially making in these kind of spaces. Now, I was asked by Vince Lane, which is an Afrikaans business um, show, to do, they wanted to do something around youth unemployment or self-employment. And they'd read about Gorko Delicious. They said to me, there is no way she sells 3,000 fed cook a day. And they asked me to um, introduce them to someone who was younger, even if they just sold 50 fed cook a day. And it's worth going to look at the Vince Lane um, show. I thought they'd need to interview me in Afrikaans, which is not very good, um, but it was in English. Anyway... I said to them, walk across the street from Gogo Delicious and um, you will find a young lady there and interview her. And I said, I don't know how many fed cook she sells because I couldn't go with them. So they walked across the road, they found that lady and that's a screen grab from the show. And uh, she's 25, she couldn't get a job in, um, in when she moved from Limpopo to Johannesburg. So she started selling a Maguinho or fed cook. She sells 6,000 fed cook a day for one rand each, and almost 1,000 rands worth of tea and coffee and so on. And these guys on Vince Lane, they just couldn't believe it. And she employs five staff. She employs a nanny to look after her kids because they start work at three in the morning, uh, and her brother and, and three other people. So she employs, in essence, five people and herself working from there, making around about 2,500 rand profit a day, six days a week. So again, we kind of have to shape our, our kind of mindsets around this. Um, this is one of my other fa favorite stories. Uh, this is a quarter, a quarter loaf of bread, slap chips, poloni, acha, and na cheese slice. Um, this is the hamburger of the townships. Um, and as I often say, you know, it's endorsed by the Heart Foundation and <laughs> it's banting friendly. Um, so in 2005, I launched cheese slices into the townships. Uh, at a time when cheese did not exist in any format in that space. Uh, we launched Parmalat cheese slices. And uh, today, Parmalat, cheese, uh, Parmalat sells 120 million rands worth of cheese slices a month, every single month, in a market that never existed before. So that's a 3.5 billion rand a year sector uh, and continues to grow in this space. 
And one of the things about it is that, uh, you know, we never invested, or Parmalat never invested in a cold chain. This was a premium product, double the price of Poloni, um, and um, it never existed in that space. And, you know, so all of these kind of things meant that why would you introduce this premium product into a space that actually potentially didn't want it. And this is where we get trapped in things like, oh, poor people want cheap shit. You know, we kind of talk about affordability. And I, I generally say, take the word affordability out of your mindset in any form of business. Uh, even people like ShopRite use affordability as a, a marketing exercise. It is actually not a, um, a, a sales exercise. And I'll tell you why I say that. I was with the guys from ShopRite and Sightsee and Kai Leacher about at the end of January this, this year. Uh, and I was doing a bit of work with them. And I walked in and they showed me this five rand bread they've got. And they sell, um, they sell like um, 400 million rands worth of five rand loaves of bread. I think it's you know, 80 odd million loaves of bread a year. And they're proudly showing me this and like we're standing there and they even have a maize meal based um, loaf of bread, more filling apparently, and they're showing me this, and I turn around, and behind me is this row of cakes, strawberry cakes, chocolate cakes, sponge cakes, beautiful cakes, and I say to them, and uh, what about the cakes? I mean, who buys these cakes if, if you know, you're know selling five rand loaves of bread? They're like, no, 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 we sell a billion rands worth of cakes a year. They sell a billion rands worth of cakes a year for like 42 to 100 rand cakes. So they sell more cakes and they sell five rand loaves of bread. And yet what do they market come to us for our five rand loaves of bread? Tells you something about our consumer. But I've done similar stuff before and I kind of just wanted to go here and say, before I go into the rest of my presentation, I spoke of a few trends last time. Um, and the first one is that I spoke about how the informal sector is going to grow and how the supermarket, the spazarettes, as I call them, supermarket-type spazers, were going to grow dramatically and become the next big kind of retail sector. And particularly that the informal sector was going to grow because there's going to be less traveling. Um, people were going to be shopping locally from the informal sector. And just as proof of this, um, there's Capitec Heriferi. Capitec sees lucrative potential in unbanked township businesses. The economy is stronger in the informal market than anyone anticipates. I'll come back to him just now. ShopRite has uh, t started ShopRite Cash and Carry because they found that it is harder for them to compete with the township spazaret uh, than to supply them. So they're actively going into, they bought uh, mass, ma mass caches um, wholesalers and their shop right cash and carry and that's an excerpt from an article from FNB scale of cash economy in South Africa stuns first strand far bigger cash only wholesalers than anticipated some wholesalers turning over more than 40 rand 40 million rand a month now in Gasinomics, which came out in 2014 I said that there were these midi wholesalers as I call them that turn over 350,000 rand a day six and a half days a week and uh, I was doing some work with FNB at the time. They said it's impossible. There's no way. So in 2021, when this article came out saying that some of these wholesalers do more than 40 million rand a month, and they found that out because they bought Salpel and they had these drop safes inside wholesalers. So this was actually cash going into, into, uh, into safes. So when they had this article as well on LinkedIn, I actually um, went onto LinkedIn and said, um, if you'd read my book, Gasinomics, in 2015, you would not be so stunned six years later. Um, which is actually one of the things about the dangers of not anticipating trends or actually appreciating the scale in this place. And with this, I find a lot of the time, it's like Khedi uh, Fouri said in a presentation, I did similar to this one today, he got up and said, Gigi, there is no way that that informal economy is as big as it is. Two months, that was in February 2022, and May 2022 is being interviewed by financial media. And I said to him, Khiri, maybe go to a township. And he came back and he started talking like this. Shoppers are shopping locally. I said this was going to happen dramatically. Transaction capital shares, you'll all have seen, plunged dramatically a short while ago. Why did they plunge so dramatically? I mean, transaction capital is an amazing business. I know David Herbert's the CEO. They plunged because commuter numbers are crashing because people are shopping closer to home. Now again, 
You know, I told you so, as this was a saying in 2015, it's written in my book in 2015, that shoppers are going to shop locally and use less taxi trips. If you ignore it, that is the potential damage that can happen um, by not understanding that. Card penetration and the opportunity inspires the card payments and withdrawal. I was doing some work for Blue Label Telecoms in about 2016, and I said, guys, you must enable your machines to accept card payments and ca cash withdrawals at Espaza shop. And we worked with them for about six months on it, and at the end of six months, they did their own research, and they said people will not withdraw money or swipe a card at, um, at Espaza shop. Our research shows that people don't trust it. Shop to Shop then launched that, and I met someone from Blue Label Telecoms a while late in 2021. He said, Gigi, have you seen what's happened with Shop to Shop? Shop to Shop is doing almost a two billion rands worth of card payments and cash withdrawals, what they call cash back, a month. More than two billion rand a month. They've moved into the top 10 most um, swiped, whatever the term is, in, in the country. Uh, and what is it? Is it a device at a spaza shop where you can withdraw money from the till and you can tap your card? So uh, Thrive is Standard Bank. They've gone aggressively into the tavern environment. They're doing more than a billion rand, I think, a month uh, through about a couple of thousand, I think about 8,000 taverns around the country. They're focused on that kind of space. This market is accelerating into this card penetration and non-cash. I spoke about the growth of uh, middle class and what I call Afropolitans. And there's a report I'll talk to just now from the UCT Liberty Institute as it came out in 2022. Thriving versus striving, the black middle class is actually thriving despite all the stuff that you're reading. And salons in the beauty sector is something, you know, in the apps, you know, everyone should be like, people are buying food, they can't afford to buy food. I heard someone else saying that here earlier. Uh, it's not true, um, not for the majority of people. Um, salons and beauty sector is booming. South African hair imports into South Africa boomed, uh, grew by 64% in the last four years. 64% growth of hair imports, one of the largest uh, growth sectors in the country. So, moving on from some of the trends. Uh, when I finished, uh, when I, I, um, I left uh, school, I became a political activist, and I kind of hushly say it with the UDF and ANC in those days. I did leave, um, to my credit. Um, but at the time, I was working in land rights, and this is every single township was four-room homes like this. At the time, this is in the 80s, I took this picture in, in 18, 1989, I took it in Diplouf in Soweto. At the time, every single house in the townships was a four-room house like this. The government built millions of these, and people lived in these houses. This is the same street today. If you can see there, the little white on the top left there, the little white gate, that's the four-room house. Every single one of these houses here was originally a four-room house. And there's been this extraordinary transformation of housing in South African townships from these four-room houses to this dramatic kind of um, growth. And we should be celebrating this. Formality is growing dramatically and accelerating. And these houses here were taken from four-room homes to those kind of double-story and, and fancy houses with no form of formal credit. No home loans, no other form of formal credit. In essence, probably through lay-by and what I call... Um, uh, or lay by stock fells in what I call uh, brick by brick home loans, which, which I won't go into now. But that is how this transformation has happened. But if you read the media, the vast proportion of people live like this in informal dwellings. You fly into Cape Town, you have these pictures that show these rows of shacks with headlines about how we're the most unequal place on the planet. What percentage of households would you guys say in South Africa live in informal dwellings like this? Out of 18 million households in South Africa, what percentage would you say live in informal dwellings or shacks? Sorry? 20? Gerifuri of Capitec said 80%, so it's just a clue. Someone said 10, 60? 70, 50, cool. 
Um, what would you say is the typical household size in South Africa? Six, five, six, two, four. Cool. So bear with me. These next two slides are the most important things that you will see today. And the rest kind of flows from it. And this is the first thing is that Formal dwellings constitute 84% of households. Only 12% of households in South Africa live in informal dwellings. So 12% of households are basically living in shacks. The vast proportion of people are living in a formal dwelling. Brick or block, corrugated iron or tile roof. On the right-hand uh, right side there, 23%, a quarter of households in South Africa are one-person households and 18% are two-people households. And in fact, our, typical, our household size is 3.3 people with a quarter of households being one-person households. Now guys, this is incredibly important. If you look there, it's very small. Of the 18 million households in 2002 to 22, in 22 years, the population grew by 1%, but households grew by double that. Between 2021 and 22, the population grew by 1%, households grew by 3%. What is happening? We have smaller and smaller households. The population is almost flatlining. We are getting more and more and more households. And in essence, if you look at our population today, the population is in essence very similar to Sweden when IKEA launched their business, and they built their business around one or two people households living in a small dwelling, and they built this flat pack kind of furniture around that. Now, I was told by one of the executives of ShopRite that they could see the impact of the economy on purchase behavior, because people were buying smaller and smaller pack sizes of staples like rice and maize meal and, and flour and so on. So I said to this exec, is that because of the economy or is it because of the growth of one person and two people households mean that people don't need a large pack size? They only need five kgs or two kgs for a one or two person household. And the exec had not heard that and went off scrambling to go and check that out and said, well, maybe there's something different. Now, if you are making your decisions for your organization based on taking a media perception that's built in your mind that, oh, people are struggling, they're suffering, they can't afford to buy maize meal, and you see it in your sales and you go like, that's what's happening, but you don't understand that actually small households don't need large pack sizes, you could be making a fundamental error in your business. And our population is changing dramatically fast. Formality is accelerating. You can see where that graph's heading. There are less and less informal dwellings and um, smaller and smaller households. And these things are important. But before I move on to why they're important, so first of all, I am not saying there aren't, it isn't shocking that 12% of people live in shacks. What I'm saying is that 12% of people is the minority. The majority are living in formal dwellings. I'm not saying that there isn't poverty. Around 12 to 15 percent maximum of our population are living on the breadline. That is unacceptable. But that is a problem for gift of the givers and the government to address those 12 to 15 percent of people living on the breadline. The balance of people, 80 percent plus of people, are actually in the lower middle and higher middle classes, and they're actually doing okay. They're under budget pressure, because budgets are under pressure, they're not under income pressure. They are two fundamentally different things. My wife's bitching about the cost of rotisserie chicken at Woolworths, and Mrs. Lamini is complaining about the price of flour at ShopRite. But that's inflation and that's budget pressure. It's not income pressure. People are still earning money. Don't get trapped. And especially when you're in business, do you want to look at the 80% or do you want to look at the 12%? If you want to look at the 12%, joint gift of the givers, start an NGO. It's tragic and that's how you should do. And we have to be careful. There are, there's an amazing book called Factfulness with a subtitle, How the World is Getting Better and You Don't Know It. And it's by a guy, Hans Rusling, who's a statistician, was a statistician, he died. And Bill Gates said it was the most important book to read in 2019, I think, when it came out. 
And anyway, it's well worth reading because it makes you relook at the world. Because one of the things he talks about is how we understand data. And, you know, in essence, he says we tend to take these data points, the lowest and the highest data point, this term of us being the most unequal place in the world. What is it telling you? It tells you we have the poorest people in the world and the richest people in the world. But it doesn't tell you about the spread in between. And the problem with that is, you know, they say if you've got one leg in boiling hot water and one in freezing cold water, on average you'll feel lukewarm. You know, that doesn't tell you much about actually how you're feeling. And this is the problem. We should be looking at spread and not at extreme data points. You know, he talks about three biases which are important. The first bias is anecdotal bias. Your maid tells you about living in a shack with her three kids and struggling to survive or her neighbor, whatever. That story is 100% true. That doesn't make that story true for the majority of the population. Do not extrapolate a story you hear and believe it's representative of the majority, even if it's 100% true and tragic. The second one is media bias. We read a headline that tells us about a gogo who lives in Kailiche in a shack that's, um, you know, uh, the water pours in, she's got six kids that she has to look after, and so on and so forth. It's 100% true, but again, don't... Um, don't extrapolate that to say it's representative of the majority of the population. And then the third one is, is a historical bias. Because it was true yesterday doesn't mean it's, it's gonna, um, uh, you know, a week ago doesn't mean it's, it was true yesterday, and it certainly doesn't mean it will be true tomorrow. One of the biggest problems we have with data is data is retrospective. It's a rear view mirror and it looks backwards and it assumes what people did bef in the past, they'll continue to do in the future. And, and this is the problem that often we have in terms of looking into the future. And a lot of what I try and do is understand what are the trends going into the future. Cool. So, why is this important about the smaller households? People invest in comfort and versus space. So they start buying a double bed instead of trying to cram into this four room house. They, invest, they spend on themselves. They spend on beauty products. Um, the more formal homes, people spend on design and decor versus function. So they don't spend just on kind of trying to formalize their house, they start spending on design and so on. And so what we are seeing is a trend where consumers are spending more on themselves, reducing spend on, on staples, shopping locally for smaller markets more often. This is a trend that is accelerating dramatically, and transaction capital have been smacked by that shopping locally one over there. In essence, your mom and her kids are moving out of the communal home at speed. We are dramatically growing people moving out of homes into their own place, whether that's a back room or whether it's another home out there. The other thing is where you see informal settlements, those people are immigrants. Not Zimbabweans and, and Malawians, South African immigrants. If you go to Kailicha, people living in the shack settlements came from the Eastern Cape or the Northern Cape or wherever it might be. Gauteng, at the turn of democracy, was, I think, the fourth biggest province population-wise. Today, it's the number one province. That is not from birth rates. Population numbers are 1% over the last 20 years, that is immigration, move, people moving into those environments. And that's a very different thing to, to kind of population growth. And what we start seeing is around these townships, A, developments happening like that at the top, or, or forum homes that are starting to be made very beautiful like that one over there, and we kind of just see this kind of explosion of things like people spending on kitchens and appliances um, within these places. All of those kind of cupboards and stuff done by a local township person who's paid, money circulates faster within those environments. The, the, the sale of appliances, if you go and talk to people like Clix or ShopRite or Pep, irons, kettles, the first thing people buy when the house is electrified is an iron, then a kettle. Uh, an iron because it's so important to iron your clothes, we go to church or school or whatever it might be. Um, People spend on ceilings. Now, you know, I said that thing. People spend on design and decor versus, um, versus uh, function. A ceiling like that has no function. 
It's purely about beauty. You cannot walk into a township house without seeing these elaborate uh, ceilings. What does that tell you about people spending what they're wanting to spend on? On ceilings. In fact, I did some work for PEP Home. It's one of the few divisions of PEP that are still, ex um, and I've just finished doing some work with the PEP group. The PEP Home business is, is really doing really well compared to all the others. Um, you know, you'd think it's food, but it's, um, you know, PEP Home decor. Um, anyway, I did some work in about 2016, 17 with the PEP group, and I, uh, we went and visited homes. I wanted to understand what furniture, what items, what decor people wanted. We went to about 200 homes around the country, and then at the end, we took the buyers on a trip into the township. And that picture there of those curtains, uh, we went to a house in Kailicha with the buyers from from Pep, and we walked into that house, and, we were, um, and the guy said, one of the buyers said to the lady, she said, I love your curtains. She said, yeah, I paid 25,000 rand when the stock fell paid out to get those curtains. He was like, no, they're very beautiful. And uh, they were all over the house, you know. The, and, and anyway, he said, I'm from Pep Home. Have you seen our curtains? And she said, yes, I have. Who buys that shit? <laughs> And of course, he's going to China to buy curtains for poor people because, of course, they can't afford to buy curtains, so they'll buy this cheap shit that he's putting in there. And this is this thing about, you know, what do people want and, and, and why they're spending. In fact, I was out with the ShopRite guys, and I took them around most of the townships in South Africa, the marketing guys, in uh, November and January this year. And I told them that one of the trends at the moment is these chrome gutters, chrome or stainless steel gutters, a huge trend at the moment. Like one in 10 houses in township have these chrome or steel, steel gutters. And uh, the marketing lady looked up and said, look at the pattern on there. What's the pattern on that chrome gutter? Come on, ladies. <laughs> Louis Vuitton. People are spending on Louis Vuitton gutters. What does that tell you? Guys, these are indicators of something that changes what the headline is telling you about this kind of space. And whether you go into an informal dwelling like this one here in a shack settlement, look at the inside, look at the lounge, look at the kitchen. Humble, but look at what people are spending. This is not just about poverty and misery. I love this little shack settlement. Uh, a little shack house, look at the roses, and so on, that people are putting in there. Another huge sector is the backroom sector. There's 20 billion rand a year is earned in backroom rental by South African households. 20 billion rand a year, um, and 25 billion rand is earned in spaza rental. So the, most of the spazas are owned by, or are run by Somalis and, and Pakistanis and Ethiopians. They pay South Africans to rent those premises. So we've got almost 50 billion rand a year in rental being earned by South African households. Now, if you went to an unemployed person who's earning 10,000 rand a month cash from renting out their back rooms, would they say, I have a job? Would they say, oh, no, no, I don't have a job, but I'm earning 10,000 rand a month? We're mismeasuring this because we don't measure these forms of incomes. Now, um, that figure of 20 billion rand a year I wrote about in uh, about uh, four or five years ago. In 2016, the government, the so Department of Housing, said that there was one million backroom rental units in South Africa, which represented 26% of all rental in South Africa. By their own figures today, there's two million um, backroom rental units, is what the government says. Average backroom rentals is, is about average it out to about two and a half thousand, one and a half to two and a half thousand. So just do the exercise. Take two million backroom rental units, take 30% off for people who are um, rent, who are not renting, who are living on their, their uh, parents um, or, or whatever home, and then multiply that by 12 and multiply it by two and a half thousand rand and you get a much bigger number. You almost get double that 20 billion rand. And why is this happening? One person and two people households. And when you start going into these units, this is the typical kind of backroom rental units. And go back to Sweden and Ikea, you start looking at that in these spaces. Not much of a kitchen. This lady was embarrassed because um, she wanted to tidy up. She lives here with her daughter in this room. Here's another back room. Beautiful little units. Um, and so there's this explosion of, of these kind of um, single people. And what we're finding is backroomers are saving on rent, 
And they're spending on themselves. They're spending on cars, electronics, decor, and, and, and so on, and eating out particularly, which I'll come to just now. Um, and eating out because you can see there, they have, don't have much of a kitchen in any of those. They don't want to cook in there, so they actually start cook, eating from the closest kind of informal spaces. But I mean, one of the guys, one of the ladies I'll talk about just now who does backroom rental at scale, I said to her, who's your customers? She said, you know, one of my customers drives an X6. He'd rather live in that unit like that, and then he drives his X6. Another customer is a... Um, is a a guy who was living in Lone Hill, who's working in Bryanston, who decided to, to um, stop renting there, who was paying 9,000 Rand a month. He moves, he's paying 2,500 Rand from Dabi Singh, and uh, he's paying off his polo. Um, and these are the kind of people in those spaces. This is the report I mentioned about thriving versus striving. I just want to highlight a few things. This is from the UCT Liberty Institute. Well worth looking at this report. It's really interesting. came out in September 2022, and in essence, it supports a lot of what I've been saying. But I'll just highlight a few things. At 3.4 million people, that's how many of the black middle class there are, there are a million more black middle class individuals than white middle class. Not a million, a million more than white middle class. The most upwardly mobile segment, and look at the last point there. The impact on their finances during the COVID-19 pandemic was limited. 70% of the black middle classes said they were not off, worse off financially because of the pandemic. This is a sector who have not been impacted by COVID lockdowns and so on for a number of reasons. But importantly, these are the guys who came out with the black diamonds. The latest thing is that there's a booming, thriving black middle class. Don't get trapped into the story of Gogo in that shack and ignore this kind of sector, because from a business perspective, that's where the opportunity lies. But let's go to some of the businesses that actually um, fuel this kind of space. Um, the Spaza sector is one of them, a huge sector, 160 billion rand a year sector. The center over there is what's the most important, is the Spaza Red sector. The Spaza Reds are a supermarket type of outlet. They are 5 to 10% cheaper than ShopRite or Pick and Pay on the same branded items. And um, about six, seven years ago, I said, this is the future of retail in South Africa, and everyone laughed at me. And today... All of the guys, shop rights and pick and pay and co, all saying like, oh shit, this has now come to be, and they're all devising strategies to kind of challenge this. And if we go into a spazaret, this is the kind of items that you'll find in a spazaret, um, and, um, you know, kind of a, a range, but this is like um, personal care items. This is a spazaret in Guamashu in KZN. Look at the personal care items. That is not a top-up or a or a um, kind of um, emergency purchase. This is a Somali guy running this outlet. He's come all the way from Somalia and he understands more about what people are looking for and what items than the South Africans. This is an Eritrean guy in Guamashu um, as well. Look at the personal care items um, that are, are selling in those places. Um, so this is one of the most dynamic, and this is where shop to shop have placed all of their devices, and this is where people are coming to tap their cards and, and withdraw, and almost all shopping has moved away from the super, the, the super mega malls and moving into this space, whether a U-save on the corner or a spazaret on the corner. Again, going back to transaction capital, people are shopping here instead of taking a taxi somewhere else. Big impact in terms of commuter patterns. The other sector is the fast food sector, a massive sector, 95 billion rand a year. This sector is accelerating dramatically. It's first of all 100% South African, whereas the, 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 the Spaza, Spaza red sector is about 75% uh, immigrant traders. This is 100% South African, growing rapidly, high profit, and most importantly, uh, it's booming because of backroomers who don't want to eat at home, and better because of Eskim. Eskim's a double-edged sword. If you're doing chicken dust like in Bali over here, you're doing better and better because she's uh, got uh, chicken dust is like a grilled chicken on a, on a drum. Bali over there, I interviewed her on, on, um, with uh, Alec Hogg of Biz News, doing something around gassipreneurs. She sells, a, she buys a thousand 
chickens. It's a little one kg flatty. She buys a, th a thousand chickens a week for 45 rand, and she sells them for 110 rand with pup and two salads. So work out how much she's making. She said to Alex, she says, she says, you know, I make so much cash at the end of the week that I now belong to three stock fells, or I'm a society, as she calls them. Uh, one, I put 15,000 rand a, a, a week in. One, I put 10,000 rand a week. One, I put 5,000 rand a week in. And she said, I've got money left over, so I now become a mashonisa, a loan shark. She desperately wants to have a shop in a shopping center. She has been to all the local shopping centers. They say, you don't qualify because they're wanting all her statements and, 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 and. What would you guys say is the most stolen product in South Africa's ports? The most stolen product, considering we, you know, our economy, our unemployment rates, and what would you say the most stolen product is? You guys. <laughs> Hair extensions are the most stolen product in South Africa's ports. And... I mean, does this make sense? And in fact, the hair sector is booming. 10 billion rand in salons. It's a huge sector, and you see it across, um, across uh, lashes, nails, uh, hair extensions, and, and, and so on, um, and a really booming sector. In fact, I call this little outlet um, Victoria's Secret. <laughs> Lingerie is the other sector that's booming. And again, what are these things indicating to us? That people are spending their money on that. Going back to those two slides about formality and people spending on themselves. These are fundamentally important. And guys, this is in an economy that you heard, um, you know, the, the first presentation today about doom and gloom. And yet, I mean, it's like, I'm not inventing this stuff. I'm, I'm, this, is, this is in the newspapers, you know. Um, and, um, in fact, I'll tell you quickly about um, hair. You know, I've done a huge amount of work in the hair, ext um, hair extension um, environment. And, um, and um, I mean, despite my hairstyle, you know, in fact, if I knew then what I know now, I'd, uh, be do I'd have different hairstyle. Um, but I was doing this work around hair extensions for a company called Godridge, which kind of is a multinational that does hair. And I came home to my wife, who happens to be white, and, and I was saying to Sue, you won't believe how many women in, in Soweto have Brazilians. And Sue was like, oh, that's really interesting. And I said, you know, I felt them. They felt real. <laughs> and Sue said, you felt they're Brazilians? Because, <laughs> of course, my wife had a very different idea of what a Brazilian is to, <laughs> to the ones I was feeling. Um, <laughs> so, uh, Another huge sector, I do a lot of work with the Heineken Group, 44,500 licensed on-premise outlets, turning over 110 billion rand a year. Um, and these are just the licensed outlets, rapidly premiumizing, people expecting to sit down to have Wi-Fi. The growth is happening, not the volume, the growth is happening in high-end products, Corona, Flying Fish, Heineken, Amstel, and so on and so forth. That is what's happening, and it's, 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 um, it's premiumizing really, really fast with an expectation of being treated in a certain way. The taxi sector is another 50 billion rand a year sector. As I mentioned, impacted. You can see those guys at the bottom right there playing pool in Warwick Street. Um, Triangle, I said to them, did you used to always pay pool, like they've got their pool table on the street there? They're like, hey, business is slow. You know, you're seeing this kind of deacceleration of the kind of, um, of the taxi sector. But still, 50 billion rand a year. So it's not growing, but it's not, uh, it's not going to decline dramatically. And then the other sector is the Stockfell sector, what I call the societies of extraordinary women. And importantly is that we've seen a shift. So, so I was contacted by a um, Unilever exec a while ago. I said, our research shows that since COVID, people aren't members of Stockfells anymore. So I was like, how do you get that? You know, we did some research. So I said, did you ask them if they belong to Amos Society uh, or Umgangel or here in the Western Cape? She was like, why? I said, well, most people that don't, you know, Stockfells are grocery buying. Most people are now in Amos Society, which is more savings or more modern form. So anyway, off she was uh, two weeks, three weeks later, I phoned her. I was like, what happened? Did you find out? She says, yes, you're right. When we ask people if they belong to a society, they belong to a society. This is the danger of, of, of some research. Our society is growing dramatically. Um, 
And increasingly, this Goko on the left-hand side there, um, I was chatting to her, I said to her, Goko, how do you communicate with the members of the Stockfell? She said, um, I use a what what? I was like, what's what what? She reached into her breast and she pulled out this little Chinese smartphone and she opened WhatsApp. And uh, she said, this what what is wonderful because before we used to send a child running down the road, go tell my ban ban whatever. Now I just what what. And, uh, and the move is dramatically on to, so first thing is happening is there's a shift towards saving stock fells. You can see that's not even my figures. Their savings is much bigger than the buying group stock fells. The second part is people are using stock fells um, lending to finance those formality of houses, informal businesses and curtains. And, um, and then the shift has been onto WhatsApp groups. WhatsApp, the stock fell is not meeting anymore, it's on the WhatsApp, you take a photo of your deposit slip and so on and so forth. So almost kind of like a digitization of the stock fells. And I don't have time, but there's a huge number of other sectors out there. If you take a mirror to the informal sector, uh, to the formal sector, you'll find exactly the same businesses operating slightly differently in the informal sector. So don't get trapped in saying, oh, the formal se informal sector is spaza shops. It's overtraded. Everyone's in a spaza shop. No one's in the fast food. No one's in the salons. No one's in all sorts of other sectors out there which are well worth um, looking at. The other important thing is businesses and residential merge. People are generally, 80% odd of people are operating from or um, in front of a residential premise or within a residential environment. And one of the things this forces people to do, or doesn't force people to do, that they generally use their personal bank accounts for their business. And when uh, Capitec, um, when I did the work with Capitec, they said, listen, we're wanting to look at, um, at the unbanked business sector. And I said to them, it is not an unbanked business sector, it is a personally banked business sector. They are all banked, but they're using their personal bank accounts. Go and have a look. And I'll come back to that just now. But what does it represent? When people merge business and, and, uh, and home, you find this is what are the opportunities for hybrid offerings? Can you have an insurance policy that covers his business as well as his life? or whatever it might be. What are the opportunities around that? Because that's how people are thinking. They're not separating these, these apart. Um, if we look at the formal sector, um, this is some pictures I took in 2019, and I said to the shopping centers council when I presented it, I said, guys, your shopping centers are going to die because people's experience in, shopping in the formal sector is bad. And I showed them these shopping experiences. These are people's shopping experiences in the formal sector. They are not premium, and they're characterized, and this was in 2019, by queues and queues and having to get onto taxis with your groceries and so on and so forth. And that was before COVID, and this has been since COVID. People's experience of the formal sector is queues and queues and queues. And... These are two-hour or four-hour queues. They queue at the ATM to withdraw their money. They queue at the PEP. They queue at the shop right. They queue, and they queue, and then they queue to get in a taxi to go home. And over and above that, they're paying a large amount of money to travel by taxi, minimum um, fare, for instance, in Umlazi, to get to a, a, a shop right is 25 rand. To get to the boxer is 15 rand one way, 15 rand the other. What are people doing? Instead of queuing, they go once a month to the shopping center, and outside of that, they're shopping closer to home. And I make this horrible joke, in a world online, South Africa stood in line. We treat our people like shit. There is no such thing as customer is king or queen in this space. We treat people like rubbish. And I've said this to the shop right guys, the pep guys I've just finished with, is like, you could, don't even talk affordability. If you just said, we'll treat you better, you won't have to queue, you would have more people coming into your shops. They hate queues. And this is how we treat them. We're talking gorgos with sore knees, moms with kids, and so on. We treat them like crap. Expect declines in mega mall footfalls and growth in neighborhood and formal, and particularly, this is growing in cash withdrawal and payments. One of the reasons shop to shop is growing so fast, you can go to a Spaza shop now, you don't have to queue up there, you go to the Spaza shop, you tap your card in a shop to shop device, and you can do what's called cashback. Cashback, you can draw 100 rand, cost you 5 rand, 
So 105 rand is going to cost you, but withdraw 200, so on and so forth. I think for 1,000 rand, it costs you 10 rand. No taxi fare, no queue. You just go to the Spiza shop to do that. And that is going to accelerate. When you can do that closer to your home, and the opportunity for providing those services within the home environment is huge. Don't leave out the rural areas. This is one of the most ignored spaces in South Africa. And this is from that report. The story of the black middle class not confined to urban areas. A quarter of them live in rural areas. We have this thing, rural towns are dying. It may be true for a place like Ermelo, which uh, hasn't got a population around it, but is not true for many others. That picture on the right there is a Lusiki Siki on the 30th of May 2020, at the <laughs> peak of lockdown. I am... Um, I got a lift by helicopter back from a talk in Pilansburg a while ago. Anton, next time. <laughs> um, and I took those pictures on the left-hand side. I was, uh, uh, my fun is riding motorbikes, and I was riding through Bushbuck Ridge. And then I rode through Umhlanga and uh, Siabuswa, which is outside Pretoria. You have no idea the houses in these rural areas. It is mind-boggling. I rode through a place called Matateni in Osizweni next door to Newcastle the other day. Look on the left-hand side. What is happening? People are moving out of those rural areas and they're aggregating within high-density populations. Look at the houses that they're building in those places. And most importantly, can you see any retail or other infrastructure there? You can ride, drive, whatever, fly over them. These are new areas, there are massive areas around townships like Pongola, Mkanduli, Pudelichaba, Toyando, Siabuswa, Mhlanga, whatever it might be. I have a list of about 100 key towns like this. There is nothing there, there's very little competitive activity happening in those spaces, and it's taking a lag before formal infrastructure moves into those spaces. And then talking about trends, and the trends basically, first of all, um, you know, I've said it more than once, local neighborhood shopping is going to accelerate. It's going to accelerate in what I call high streets. High streets are the main arterials within townships. It's the main roads in townships. You can go on Google, you'll see these high streets. And they, it'll be at convenience centers and, and, and these main arterials where the taxis operate. And what we're going to see more and more of is decentralized smaller stores um, and people like YouSave are investing in that kind of format. The Spazarette is already on the high street. The problem is, is that people cannot find premises. If you're a pick and pay and you're wanting to get a quality save on every corner, you can't get premises. People don't have title deeds, so you can't buy the property if you find someone who wants to sell and, and, and. So actually the opportunity lies in not trying to compete with them with a you save and try and find premises. It's actually about how do you engage with that sector like ShopRite are doing with their, their, um, their um, uh, uh, wholesale business. The other thing that is happening is people's People are changing, there's this cultural transformation to what I call Gassipolitans. Now, I wrote in my books about Afropolitans, who are people who are culturally Xhosa, Zulu, Tswana, whatever it might be, but who are ultra-modern and sophisticated at the same time. Now I'm increasingly talking about Gassipolitans, and these are people who are sophisticated, well-off, middle-class people whose entire life revolves around a township who are not moving out of the township to go shopping or to get their hair done or to go to the fast food outlet. They are focused around there, and the township is increasingly a suburb, a playground, a business space, and so on. In the old days, people used to... The townships were dormitory towns. Now they're suburbs and cities within their own environment, and people are leaving them less and less and less and less, and this is going to accelerate. This is Dabi Singh. Debbie Singh uh, rents out back rooms. She rents out, um, she rents out uh, about um, 11 back rooms behind her house. That's her house in Protea for about 2,500 to 3,000 rand a month. Uh, she then has um, 14 back rooms she rents out to students, student accommodation for 9,000 rand a room, fully equipped and stuff. She gets 140,000 rand a month put into her bank account. And um, she's now bought a third 
property in Pimville next to the University of Johannesburg. She wants to demolish it and build 30 units. She bought it with her own money. She needed one and a half million rand from her bank. She went to her bank, she said, could you lend me one and a half million rand? And the bank said, it took weeks, and then they said no. So she decided, despite the fact that she earns a salary from the city of Joburg, and she's getting 150,000 rand a month into a bank, they turned it down. So she decided to test them. So she applied, the bank is APSA, she applied to APSA for a, um, for a um, car loan for a Mercedes worth 1.3 million, million rand. And they approved it in 20 minutes. As she said, you know, Gigi, one appreciates and one depreciates. The important thing about that is like, can you imagine, we cannot get our heads around this sector in terms of that actually there's a business here. And yet, if we look at it, the government has recognized this rise of informal rentals, worth having a look at this article. There's a need for 1.8 million houses today, or back rooms, worth 343 billion rand. And the government says that they cannot um, do that so that they're opening it up to what they're calling micro-developers, read home owners. Jordan Hill Lewis in Cape Town is saying the same about the Western Cape. Why is this important? Formality of do-it-yourself do housing is constant. There are more and more households with, the, with new needs. Decline of larger houses, I spoke about this. New families, there are more and more new families happening. The minute people leave the home, that's a new family. Are you talking to them? Immigration to metros, dramatic immigration to the metros, whether that's Port Elizabeth Metro, Eteguini Metro, whether it's Gauteng, whether it's a Western Cape, and these are new consumers who've come from rural environments into the space. Are you talking to them? And money is sent home for home building at a scale that's mind-boggling. Go to those rural areas. In fact, there's a vendor saying, which I can't even tell you, which says, people work for their home. Basically, they're sending money home to be spent on building the house at home. You could live in a shack here, but at home, you've got this grand, beautiful, double-story home, and that is happening. There you go. And it is happening at a scale. Guys, do yourselves a favor. Go to Zanin. Drive from Limpopo, uh, from Polokwane to Zanin. Drive from Zanin to uh, Nelspreit. Drive to Pongola. Go diving in Sudwana and you drive through Pongola and you cannot believe the houses. Go if you're in the KZN, drive through Osizweni or Matadeni. I mean, the houses are like extraordinary. And so people are sending money home for home building. Are you catering to these trends? Are you anticipating that? Are you building products that fulfill these kind of needs and these new consumer and new consumer segments? So I'm gonna jump past this one. Um, and this is a um, young guy called Rafilwe. Rafilwe has got a bakery in Soweto. At lockdown, his business nearly died. And so Rafilwe said to me, you know, he said all his customers stopped. He was selling 500 loaves of bread a day. So he said, Gigi, I moved on to e-commerce. And what he did is he put his business on to Facebook Lite, and every hair salon, every bakery, every, most of these businesses, backroom guys have a Facebook Lite page. And he then invited people to send their e-pin, their pin location, and then by WhatsApp to send their order. And he went from 500 loaves of bread at the beginning of lockdown to 2,000 loaves of bread today. In fact, what's killing him is load shedding. And he's looking for a loan to try and fix something. All these guys say, you know, don't ignore the government, you just carry on yourself. The point about this is there's a dramatic move towards delivery and WhatsApp and Facebook-based e-commerce. E-commerce is not going to be on an app. It's not going to be on a website. It's going to be on Facebook Lite and WhatsApp. Even Mbali, I showed you with chicken dust. She does 20% of her chickens. She gets EPIN at the WhatsApp. And why is this? Facebook Lite A doesn't use much data. Every little smartphone that comes out from um, Pep or whoever comes preloaded with Facebook Lite and WhatsApp. WhatsApp, you buy a bundle. So even if you have no data or airtime, you have a bundle and you can carry on in essence We're using WhatsApp until your bundle expires. If you've got a month bundle, you have unlimited access to WhatsApp. 
It's a very unique kind of thing we have in South Africa. And so what's happening is increasingly this move to, if you're not on a Facebook-based platform and a WhatsApp, WhatsApp for business is extraordinary. I've invested and involved in a business called Yebo Fresh. We moved off an app and an online thing to a WhatsApp platform, and we saw this incredible acceleration of, of, of in, engagement and orders and so on. And even within the townships, delivery is happening all the time, even if it's informal delivery. And what's important to this, the only thing missing is payment. <laughs> uh, think about that. E-commerce is heating up. These three, Jebel Fresh, I mentioned, Trade Depot raised about, a one, uh, about like $100 million in uh, Nigeria. They've entered South Africa. Sabi Vumele have just they were raised $100 million. Now they've just raised another $120 million, uh, actively moving into South Africa. Jabu is a Namibian business that raised, I think, $30 million. The e-commerce is accelerating in South Africa. And why? Because... The Spaza shop would rather send you a WhatsApp and have the delivery. We don't know who will be successful with these e-commerce wars, but guys, it's moving there very fast. And we're seeing this non-cash acceleration. I mentioned shop to shop just now. There's Salpel, there's cashback, and so on. We're seeing this acceleration um, in this space. I've been involved for the last two years with launching PayShop with BankServe. Most of you should know what it is. Uh, I think it's going to be quite a game changer down the line, not immediately, but in the foreseeable future, card payments and cash withdrawals at tills of various forms is going to accelerate. There's also a war happening in, in this kind of space over here. Um, okay, so more or less as I end, I've made some educated guesses about what's going to happen going forward within broadly your kind of space. So don't hold them to me. You can take a photo of the slide and then uh, next time tell me I was speaking rubbish. Capitec's going to innovate in small business banking accounts. Uh, and time, I think, is, is, is worth definitely moving there. I'm not convinced they're going to get it right. Capitec are going to do something dramatic in this space very soon. Shop to shop. Entering further financial services, again, I haven't heard from them, I'm guessing. Banking loans, financing, and so on, off that platform that they currently have. Capitec's going to enter the unsecured home loan market. Uh, in essence, unsecured in the sense that people don't have a title deed, but they own those houses. The biggest growth is going to be in backroom and flat-lit renting. I showed you the size of that, how fast um, households are growing. There's a demand for financing backrooms, flats, and so on. Capitec will launch PayShop with a bang, probably in August. Um, I assume everyone knows what PayShop is, um, which will give it massive traction. It's not going to get traction until Capitec launches in that space, and they're currently protecting their internal phone-to-phone -phone payments. But I think there's also a huge opportunity for wallets to use PayShop to get off the rails. This is one of the big things that uh, uh, PayShop can do, is enable you to pay outside of going to a till to, un to load money or take money off. It's really a big opportunity for all those wallets who, in essence, are stuck in certain rails to, to, to grow. Card and app is going to accelerate. Already, Capitec has 11 million people using their app. 11 million people using their app. I think it's uh, out of 20 million odd accounts. The next closest is FNB with 1.8 million people using their app. 11 million people are using that app and actively using that app. It tells you, and again, going back to PayShop, which will operate off an app, uh, why that'll happen, less and less cash in the system. And the reason I have why, if the Yebo Fresh, because of hijackings and internal dramas, decided to not accept cash at all. They do about three or four million rands worth of deliveries to spazas, to about uh, like 4,000 spazas a month. And they went in May, March and they said no more cash, zero. From 90% cash to no more cash. And they lost... 70% of their business in March, in April, in May, they were back to the same 90%. Tells you how rapidly people just adapt to, to non-cash forms of payment. Hustling will accelerate more informal businesses and more hybrid formality. 
We don't move from informal to formal. We move from informal to a hybrid where we adopt things that, are, that we formalize. We might find a formalize through a bank account or a payment system or whatever it might be. Other things people leave informal. There's going to be an acceleration of hybrid formalization. Out of home and casual dining to grow. Where spices was the big thing, Our food is going to be the next big thing and is continuing to it. Already we see it. Capitec showed figures the other day. The headline was South African um, consumers are being, you know, like being put into poverty or something like that. And there, one of the lines it said that Capitec are seeing a growth of 12% in, um, in spend at fast food outlets. So while we're saying like people are spending less on, on, on groceries, they're spending more on, and that's through card swipes at a KFC or a Spur or something like that. Can you imagine in the, the chicken dust outlet or the gourd outlet and stuff like that? Because of, because of back roomers who don't want to cook at home, because of, um, back, um, uh, back, um, what's it called, um, load shedding, people are going to increasingly buy food out of home. That food space is going to grow and including the alcohol sector. Gazi car market, accelerate, taxi down, bucky brigade up. What does the first job unemployed youth in the township do in every township, every rural area? The first business they start, a car wash. What does it tell you? You don't find car washes in Mozambique or Lagos tells you about ownership of personal cars that people wanting to clean and, and make it look cool. That sector of the Gassi, every single township, and you talk about indicators. If you think the traffic is bad in, in uh, Cape Town, try and get out of Soweto at 7 in the morning or get back into Soweto at 5 in the afternoon. Do it in Kaili, even Kailicha, which is theoretically a lot poorer, or Mlazi, or Guamashu, or wherever it might be. When I, I went on my motorbike ride on Friday night, I left Joburg, took a long windy road, and then to Zanin, between Polokwane and Zanin, there's a big urban environment there. The traffic jam on Friday at 4.30 was 30 kilometers long. And I would say one in 20 of those was a taxi. That's Polokwane, supposedly one of the poorest provinces you can go to. 30 kilometers long, and I asked one of the locals, he's like, it's like this every day. Fiber Wi-Fi, there's already a land grab happening there. Wi-Fi, you may have seen one of those back rooms, a little Wi-Fi thing on there. The land grab starting, people are desperately wanting um, to be online. Uh, people like uh, Vumatel and so on accelerating there. Solar, and I put in brackets, finance solar is going to grow and is a huge opportunity. Building extension and formality will continue. Home decor, you look at PEP's figures just the other day. Home decor, the PEP, PEP home is, is growing. And really the last one, and I'll be very quick about this and end, unemployment, the figures are rubbish. This is in 2019, I said they were closer to 12%. Um, as I, I mentioned so I did some stuff with Capitec in February 2022. And as I said, Geri said this cuck, and I said, Geri, maybe go to a township and see for yourself. And one of the things I told them was a thing I mentioned that they, they personally banked, not uh, business, uh, not unbanked. And the third thing I said was that they work from home and they're just, you know, using their personal bank accounts. So in May 2022, Geri and you can get this um, podcast from on the business show, Bruce Whitfield is interviewing Gheri Furi and says, Gheri, your figures were amazing, but where is the opportunity for growth? The economy's fatlining, unemployment's at unprecedented levels, where's the opportunity for growth? And Gheri Furi said, Bruce, I went to visit a township the other day. You cannot believe how much business is happening in the township and how many informal businesses there are. And he said, we underestimate the size of the informal economy. He says, when I came back from the township, I told my people to find out how many personal bank accounts receive more than, um, how many personal bank accounts receive a deposit of more than f um, 3,000 rand, more than five times a month. Because he said four and four and a half times a month is a weekly wage earner. 
So how many people were depositing 15,000 rand minimum more than five times, a, at least five times a month? And he said, we have a million bank accounts of people depositing that much money in their accounts. Capitec has a million bank accounts where people are depositing 15,000 rand minimum over five different deposits. Those are all businesses. Let's take that and let's just accelerate that and say, how many banks are there? There are five big banks. Let's say that the others only do 300,000 or 400,000 of like Capitex million. You're still talking about four million businesses out there that are not measured in our economy. So we're not measuring things like informal economy, non-work incomes, multiple incomes, and so on and so forth. And these represent a massive opportunity. If you go to downtown Johannesburg, you will find on the wall a poster that says, find lost lover. Another one will say, get an abortion. Another one will say, um, uh, um, get a loan. Blacklist not important. Bring three months bank statements and three months pay slips. Because if you do not have a pay slip in South Africa, you do not exist. And in expecting to only cater to the pay slip part of our population, we're ignoring a massive part of our population. And so really, um, you know, we often data rich and insights poor. We need to be aware of that. Headlines are not the long-term reality or the majority. The headline may be true today, but is that the trend? And is it the long-term? Beware of these biases I mentioned. And most importantly, from a business perspective, what's reading the long-term trend? Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. Awesome. But don't go anywhere, don't go anywhere. Uh, absolutely, absolutely awesome. So something's, oh, thank God for that. I lost my pen. I love these pens. <laughs> oh, good. Um, something slightly different then. We're going to, we've got 12 minutes before we're going to go for lunch. Um, I'm just going to ask the guys to cue 60 seconds of music just to put you into a thought uh, mindset and give you one minute to write down two or three things that you're going to look at, actively do differently on the back of what you've just heard on this particular presentation. I mean, it's profound. I've listened to it several times. And every, I could listen to the same presentation and it gets me thinking about different things. It's that important. Last year, we put the thought process out to all of you that what would happen if we live in a world which is exponential and how are you going to change your business strategies? Okay. After this one, the question is, now that you've heard about this opportunity in this space where I would imagine most of you, like me, are flying blind. And our one-eyed man here has come in and introduced some profound insights as he bridges both of these worlds. So if we can cue some sort of ambient music of some sort. We'll give you 60 seconds, and then I'm going to pick on a couple of you to ask what you are actually thinking about doing. All right, I reckon that's about 60, uh, 60 seconds. I think it didn't require a huge amount of thought, because I think it's just writing down what you've already been thinking. So I don't know, Akello, Ikoko, Adumo, Cybrin, uh, the Ventures Groups, the Mauritius Guys, Retail Capital. Who wants to start with a few thoughts about things? You'd, there you go. KYC, um, you talk about all these sort of informal loans and uh, t things that take place. How does the KYC work and, uh, and the trust? Yeah. So, so let me get kind of I'll come back to that in a sense. So one of the biggest, biggest problems we have in this space is that, you know, the, the Ministry of Small Divis Business Development has been trying to say we're going to help these informal businesses, but they have to be CIPC registered. Now, most people don't uh, pay as you go electricity, so there's no utility bill, and most people have no proof of residence of any form whatsoever, and most of the township places don't actually have proper addresses. You could use a PIN location, but you can't accept a PIN location for a CIPC registration. It's one of the things I said to Captec, because there's a difference between ownership and title deed, and it's about a different idea of spatial and I think one of the problems that we have is that we should be looking at different ways of proof of residence and, and, and all of these other things. Um, and what are they? Um, you know, you've got an account at the wholesaler you've been running for the last 10 years and so on and so forth. So, 
so first of all, we have to kind of consider how do we actually do things like a utility bill or a pay slip um, and so on. And I did a little bit of work for transaction capital a few years ago. One of the things they found is that people were paying back, they buy this debt from like Edgars and co, and they'd buy the debt and then they'd manage it. And the whole idea is to extend the debt once someone has paid it off. So then they'd go to people, they'd say, well done, you paid for your debt, can we now give you more debt? And they'd say, I'd love it. And they'd say, okay, cool, we'll send us your pay slips. The person would say, I'm unemployed. <laughs> and so they were like, now they knew the person had been paying religiously, and so they were having to relook at it. And one of the things I was suggesting is then how do you then say, well, if you aren't employed, do you have, are you renting back rooms, and can you prove that? And is that money going into your bank account? If it's not bang, going into your bank account, well, get it to go into your bank account for three months, and at the end of three months, we will then afford you that, that and so on. So it's about how do we look differently at, at that income that people are receiving that's outside of, of that. The other thing is, um, you know, people do have ownership. Um, and there's various ways that they can actually prove that ownership and where the address is and stuff. Um, and then going to the KYC thing, I mean, you know, I don't know enough about this, but I often use this example of, so most township people have been there for three or four or five generations. And I use the ask for directions thing. If you go to an informal settlement, most of those people are recent. If you went to Dipsluit, parts of Kailicha, and you went there and you said, I am looking for Mrs. Lamini, and Mrs. Lamini lived 500 meters away, most of them would say, we don't know. But if you went to parts of Kailicha that are established, where multi-generational gooks or, 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 or Soweto or Soshangove or Mlazi, those people have lived there for three or four generations. If you ask for directions, let's say Mrs. Lamini, she's 5 k's away, you go down here and, do, 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 and they'll tell you exactly where to go. And so this thing that people have been in those places for years, they have a social record. Um, and what is that social record and how can they prove it? Uh, and there's other things that we should be looking at. And I believe strongly that the government in, has to also look at that. I mean, I've done a bit of work with the Payments Association kind of stuff. It's about how do you look differently at these things like, like um, registration. In Rwanda, it takes you four days to register a business using different tools. In South Africa, if, assuming you've got all those tools, it takes you 40 days to register your business. This wasn't my figures, it was someone else's. I sold my business and I tried to go on my own, or went on my own, and I was used to having a financial director and this and that and the other. I registered my business and I wanted to register for VAT. And I asked my accountant to do it for me. And the SARS guys in Randburg said I had to come for an interview. So I went to SARS, I sat for four hours on a steel bench with my accountant sitting next to me before I had a five minute interview and then the guy said, no, I don't see why you can't have a VAT number. Can you imagine any informal business going and registering their business? Can you imagine the CIPC process, you need this, you need that, you need whatever it might be. We have to look at that differently. In Kenya, there's been some very, um, innovative things, there's a business called Tala that does uh, loans and stuff, uh, T-A-L-A, and, and they actually have built an app, and one of the things on the app has got a kind of thing like, do you ever, you have to leave your GPS on, and then they track you for like three weeks, and then they've worked out this risk profile that says if you travel more than a kilometer away from your home, uh, X amount of time, you generally would be a higher risk than someone who just stays within a certain neighborhood. You have to sh register each time you make a financial transaction. I went to the Spaza shop, and they simplified it. It's a very clever way of looking at it differently. So my thing is, is that we're trapped in this thing. You've either, you have to pay by debit order, and you have to have this kind of pay slip and all of these. And we need to look differently and innovate around that. The person who's going to innovate around that is going to like explode. So it's not a direct answer, but it's about saying, like, how do we look at it differently? And there's other mechanisms we can use. I'm not letting you get the mic again with an answer that took that long. Uh, we, we did, I'm going to just give you an example of what we did with Vodacom. I'm talking now, I think it was 20, I, I can't remember. When that whole thing about RECA happened, and, and Vodacom came to us and said, we have like 100,000 people who are going to 
not Rika, and then we're going to lose them. We know where they are because they live within a certain base station proximity in rural areas. So what we did is we took those base stations and we identified, I had a database of every government school in this country, we identified every government school, we then employed the teachers at the school over the June holidays, to, um, as we, we, we um, taught them how to RECA, we gave every school child a letter to their mom saying, Mom, you better RECA. And the way to RECA is that um, the regulations say, if your post comes to your school or trading store, you can use the school or your trading store as proof of address. And we had a school stamp on the form signed by the teacher, and we issued that, and we must have done tens of thousands of RECAs over, over literally 10 or 14 days around the country. And that's another way you can just do a proof of identity. Your school, if it's your postal address, which for many people it is, you can utilize that, or at your local trading store and so on. Cool. Uh, Andrews, two or three things this, this presentation's got you thinking about. Um, yeah, Gigi, thanks a lot for very information, very informative. Um, obviously, in, in part of our group, and for many years, we've really operated in the township market and the emerging markets, and, our, pretty much our purpose and strategy as a group is to solve for a lot of these problems uh, as our primary drive. But what we have found is that the infrastructure and the, call it banking, financial services, even government structures, for generations have built up around a formal economy. And therefore, for the banks to change, or anything to change, the systems, the credit vetting process, and <coughs> a whole lot. You know, it's like moving a, trying to get a tanker to try to turn a, a, yeah. do a U-turn. So I think the, the opportunity for us is to, and not just as a Kelo, but I think as a Crossfin consortium, is that we have multiple products and services that actually solve for probably 90%, if not more, of what a Spaza owner requires, be it issuing a bank account, be it a wallet, be it acquiring, be it media, uh, platform businesses. If I look across the, the groups here, and I think the solution for a real surge in an in a opportunity for the, for the markets there, not just in Spaza, but taverns, um, in hair salons, etc., is a concerted effort as a group to solve for the problem. Because we have it all. There is, don't think, any other group in this country that can actually solve it. The only thing we've got to do is get out of the lanes of trying to make profit everywhere. Because that's been the problem with the banks. They can't afford a card terminal for someone who's only doing a thousand rand of transactions and it's a four thousand rand terminal and it's got to be serviced with paper and no electricity. So they're not going to service that customer. Yeah. But there are other solutions. So for me, the takeout is the market opportunity that you have demonstrated in more statistical form to what we've actually understood before. I agree with you, and, and you, you said the word business solutions. That reality is that most people are coming to sell a product an offering, a funeral um, insurance, whatever it might be. And I really believe the opportunity is how do you create a, a, a business solution? And there's many you know, reasons you can look at that, but almost all of these businesses want to um, grow their business, and they're looking for ways of managing their cash or getting a loan and so on. I mean, I think there's a huge opportunity in offering businesses a service where you can help them do PAYE and register their staff for UIF and give them a provident fund type insurance product, which means when I'm sick, you know, my, I have, I have a live, you know, like um, I get paid out or whatever it is, especially if you're sole proprietor or can you do something for your staff. No one's doing that kind of stuff. Everyone comes to me and says, can we do funeral? You know, it's like, please. You know, so I think that this broader thing of like it's a payments platform and an insurance product and um, an ordering product and um, an infrastructure loan and, and all of these kind of things, when we look at them as a business and we say, how do we offer a full solution, whether it's across different um, things, then it can work. And I did some work for Standard Bank over COVID and I helped them launch um, their MIMO business account, which was a very frustrating process. But um, I would say, well, why don't we do this? They'd say, no, 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 we have to then go and speak to the credit division. And then why can't we incorporate a personal thing with the business product? Oh, no, we, that's personal banking. And then there's this personal banking and that, and, and like, because of that silo, there's just no way they'll ever do it. I mean, even a Capitec faces that, probably to a lesser extent. But when you start looking at it without those silos, and you don't say, we're going to create a business bank account, we're going to create an account for a business, and he needs to have a, an account for his kid to pay for 
a, a, a quarter at the schoolyard as well as his wife needs this and he also needs this for his business and his staff. It suddenly is a very, very much more powerful and much more, um, uh, 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 you know, there's much more opportunity to get stickiness and traction around that. All right, I think unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on uh, how hungry you are, it's lunchtime. So, first up, round of applause for Gigi. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, second up is a prediction from my side that at least 50% of your companies are going to be interacting with Gigi in some way or another over the next 12 months before we get back here. Let's see if that one um, actually pans out. Uh, number three is you're going to be around for a little bit longer. You're going yeah. at two, right? Yeah. So if you've still got questions, then I'm assured that you're coming for lunch and, and you're happy to go and take further questions cool. um, when we go through into it. And then the last thing is, just on the back of that, those two or three things that you've written down, let's set that as, as a uh, prediction for next year as well. How, and this comes from a conversation that we were having yesterday about the majority of people that Gigi talks to, they're blown away by his presentation. It's only a minority of the guys that actually do something off the back of it, and that's incredibly frustrating. If you're an impactful speaker like he is, to know that the answers have just been presented and the people aren't doing anything is just absolutely crazy. So we'll put that prediction out there. Um, have a little chat about it later, obviously, but I'm hoping that next year we're going to have a couple of the presentations from you guys on the floor where there's some profound change in your strategies around these township economies.